Hi friends, this is Dr. Ralph Wilson with the Jesus Walk Bible Study Series. Today we're beginning a five-week series on Behold the Lamb of God. This is Lesson 1, Basic Concepts of Sacrifice. We'll be looking particularly at our theme verse, John chapter 1, verse 29. Today we are beginning a journey of discovery to learn what it means to call Jesus the Lamb of God. I hope you'll begin with an open heart and mind. Probably some of you have heard all this before. For others, it will be brand new and maybe a little disturbing. My goal for us is to understand at a deeper level just who Jesus is and what he did for us. And not only to understand it, but to internalize its values and commitment. But to get to this place, we need to begin slowly and carefully. I don't want to assume that you know anything already, nor do I want to overwhelm you. You know, the Bible is literally full of thousands of verses bearing on the themes that we'll be studying. Some of you can quote some of them from memory, but I'll purposely resist the temptation to give you all the cross-references that prove or illustrate every point. Rather, my method will be to look deeply at a few passages of Scripture. It's simpler that way for us to learn. Well, to begin, let's examine our theme passage. John the Baptist is preaching a message of repentance and baptism for the forgiveness of sin. Thousands have come to him as he is baptizing along the Jordan River. One day, John speaks about the Messiah for whom he has been sent to prepare. And now our theme verse, John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. John also repeats this saying a little later in verse 36. Well, the context of these verses don't tell us a great deal about what John the Baptist actually meant when he said this. So let's examine the words themselves. First is behold the Greek particle ide, which can be taken two ways, to, to point out something which the speaker wishes, to which the speaker wishes to draw attention, look, see, and then to indicate a place or individual, here I am or here is so and so. So the New Revised Standard Version translates this verse, here is the Lamb of God. John draws attention to Jesus and indicates that Jesus is the focus of his words which follow. Let's look at these words one by one. Lamb, the Greek noun amnos, refers to a young sheep, including at least up to one year old. In the book of Revelation, the noun arneon is used to designate a sheep of any age. And then it's the lamb of God. Of God can mean either sent from God or perhaps owned by God. John is saying that Jesus, in some way, is like a lamb sent from or provided by God himself, who takes away the sin of the world. Sin is the common Greek noun harmartia. Originally, it meant to, to miss the mark, to be mistaken. It occurs 173 times in the New Testament as a comprehensive expression of everything opposed to God. Sin and forgiveness of sin are major themes of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments. <laughs> well, our modern society really doesn't like the concept of sin at all. Though dealing with guilt <laughs> is a major psychological problem that plagues people of all religions and no religion. If we are intent to understand what Lamb of God really means, then we must be willing to discuss the forbidden S-word, sin. Sin of the world. Of the world employs the Greek noun cosmos, which refers here to humanity in general. Jesus doesn't come to deal with just a single person, or the sin of just the Jewish people for that year, but the sins of everyone in the whole world for all time. Take away describes what the Lamb will do with sin, employing the Greek verb iro, which means generally to lift up and move from one place to another. Here it means to take away, remove, blot out, behold. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What specific lamb is John the Baptist referring to? It could be the Passover lamb, or the lamb described in Isaiah 53, or perhaps he's using it in a general sense. The context doesn't help us pinpoint it further. But clearly, John indicates that Jesus is the Lamb of God in some sacrificial sense, since lambs were commonly used by Jews for sacrifices to obtain forgiveness for sin. Our next step is to try to understand animal sacrifice. But before we do that, let's pause for discussion question one. This is the way it works. We'll look at the discussion question, you stop the DVD, and then discuss it with your group, and when you finish discussing it, then turn on the DVD again and we'll go on to the next point. Discussion question one, based on John 129, how do you know that John the Baptist statement about the Lamb of God refers to sacrifice? How was the comprehensiveness of sin of the world so radical a concept? Pause the DVD now, then turn it on when you're ready. Well, nearly every culture throughout the world has employed sacrifice, usually animal sacrifice, to somehow appease the anger of the gods. Many moderns have dismissed this sort of appeasement as primitive and an ignorant gesture. They are offended by the idea that blood must be shed to make atonement and have searched for other theories of the atonement that provide simpler explanations. However, to be faithful to scripture, we can't disregard sacrifice so cavalierly. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sacrificed to God as part of their worship. We don't have an indication that they were trying to appease an angry God. That explanation is a straw man that applies better to pagan sacrifice than Jewish sacrifice. At Mount Sinai, God gave Moses explicit instructions to build an altar of burnt offering in the tabernacle, as well as rather complex instructions concerning types of sacrifices appropriate for various kinds of offenses. Yet, anger must be part of our understanding. We live in a society that seeks to pull God down to its own level. But a careful reading of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy make it quite clear that God is to be considered holy and righteous, separate from humans and human sinfulness. Human sin, that is, the breaking of God's laws, is deeply offensive to God. Unless their sins are cleansed, humans may not even approach his holy presence. God is angry, not at humans for their own sake, but at their sin. Now, this may shock you, but anger at sin really shouldn't surprise us. If your spouse lies to you, shouldn't you be angry? Sad, yes, but angry too. If your spouse is unfaithful to you, shouldn't you be angry? Or should you be passive in the face of immorality and deceit? Moral people are outraged at sin. Immoral people are calloused with regard to sin. Well, it's one thing to be angry, but anger must not lead to injustice. The God of the Old Testament cannot be accurately described as capricious, acting out of mere anger. Nor, for that matter, is he perpetually angry. In Exodus 34, 6 and 7, he is described as the Lord, the Lord the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Let's pause now for discussion question two. Why is anger an appropriate response to sin? What is the difference between capricious or uncontrolled anger and anger that brings about justice? Pause the DVD now 
and then turn it on when you're finished discussing. God provides animal sacrifice as a way that justice can be done, that men and women's sins can be atoned for, and that they can approach God once more. We moderns are often repulsed by the very idea of killing an animal. The Israelites, on the other hand, were herdsmen. Our forebears were farmers. But we city folk don't routinely butcher animals, drain out their blood, and cut them up. About the closest we come is cold meat in a styrofoam tray or butcher's wrap from the supermarket. We eat meat for the most part, but we are insulated from the killing that is required. Nevertheless, taking of any life should affect us as it affected the Israelites. The Israelites were very well aware that blood required taking of life. Well, now let's pause for discussion question three. Why is animal sacrifice repulsive to modern people, do you think? How much of this has to do with a city versus a farming way of life? Pause the DVD now and then turn it on when you're finished discussing. Well, taking of life, even to eat, is never a trivial thing. God tells Moses in Leviticus 17.11, For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The word translated atonement here is the Hebrew verb kapar, kipper, to make an atonement, make reconciliation, purge. An equivalent Arabic root means cover or conceal, but evidence that the Hebrew root means to cover over sin is weak. Rather, the idea of kippur seems to be to purge, related to an Akkadian cognate kapuru, meaning to wipe clean. Our English word atonement comes from the Middle English at one meant, or reconciliation, which expresses the result of an atoning sacrifice. To sum up, atonement in Hebrew seems to mean to wipe clean, purge, a sacrifice that cleanses from sin. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, there were five types of sacrifices in the tabernacle and later in the temple. One, a burnt offering. Two, a grain offering. Three, a peace or fellowship offering. Four, a sin or purification offering. And five, a guilt or reparation offering. To comprehend the basics of sacrifice, let's look carefully at a sacrifice for purification from sin by a common person, which displays the typical elements. Here, a female goat or lamb is referred to. Let me read Leviticus 5, verses 5 through 6. When anyone is guilty in any of these ways, he must confess in what way he has sinned. And, as a penalty for the sin he has committed, he must bring to the Lord a female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. And then Leviticus 4, 32 to 35. If he brings a lamb as his sin offering, he is to bring a female without defect. He is to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. Then the priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering with his finger and put it on the horns of the altar of burnt offering and pour out the rest of the blood at the base of the altar. He shall remove all the fat, just as the fat is removed from the lamb of the fellowship offering. And the priest shall burn it on the altar on top of the offerings made to the Lord by fire. In this way, the priest will make atonement for him, for the sin he has committed, and he will be forgiven. So, here are some of the key elements of sacrifice as they appear by the time the Mosaic Law is given. Simplify just a little. One, confession of the sin. Two, 
bringing an animal that has no defect that might decrease its market value. It must be healthy and whole, or it is not fit to offer to God. An animal like this could be rather costly, though a poor person might bring a pair of pigeons or doves instead. Number three, the sinner is to lay his hands on its head. There seems to be a sense in which the offerer's sin is imparted to the animal through the laying on of hands. At least we see that on the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. Number four, he must slay the animal by cutting its throat. Five, blood is collected by a priest, put on the horns of the altar, and poured out at the base of the altar. Six, the fat portions are removed, which are given to the priest and burned on the altar. Seven, the meat is eaten by the priests in the case of a sin offering. In the case of a, a peace or fellowship offering, most of the meat would be eaten by the offerer and his family as a kind of sacred meal or celebration before the Lord. Well, from this analysis of a sacrifice for sin, I see several principles. One, confession or acknowledgement of sin is a necessary part of the sacrifice. Two, a sacrificial animal is costly to the sinner. Nothing is free here. Three, there is a close identification between the sinner and the sacrifice. The imparting of sin by the laying on of hands suggests that the animal becomes a substitute for the sinner. Four, killing the animal is very personal. It is not done for the sinner by a third party, but by the sinner himself. Well, we've got a lot to process, and what I'd like us to do is pause now for discussion question four, based on these two passages in Leviticus 4 and 5. What are the basic elements involved in a sacrifice for sin? Which of these are still necessary for forgiveness of sins today? Which are no longer necessary? And why? Pause the DVD now and then resume when you finish discussing. Well, in spite of this elaborate sacrificial system, the Hebrews became aware that all these sacrifices alone were inadequate to really cleanse their sins. God didn't owe them forgiveness because they went through some ritual. Nor was God impressed or gratified by all this killing of animals, as many Old and New Testament passages indicate. In fact, the author of Hebrews rightly declares, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. For the, the lesser animal cannot really substitute for the greater human being. Man needs someone greater than himself to actually atone for and do away with sin. There is a real sense in which God uses the sacrificial system to teach the Jews lessons about sin about holiness, confession, forgiveness, sin's costliness, and sin's horror. God, in his mercy, allows these sacrifices to purge their sins. But the only fully adequate sacrifice for sin is still to come. This is the context from which John the Baptist speaks when he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is greater than our analogies, of course, but there is a sense in which the analogy of the sacrificial lamb fits Jesus accurately, since he, as the Son of God and Son of Man, is the one perfect and great enough being to actually atone for sin and, at the same time, represent and substitute for all men in this atonement, once and for all. Look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray together. Father, I'm aware again of how horrible all that killing and blood must be. 
It forces me to think about the horror of my own sin and rebellion against you. And the horror of sacrifice that my sins require so that I might be cleansed and stand before you forgiven. Sometimes I've passed over sin, made it something trivial when it is not. Forgive me, Lord, for my sins. In the name of the Lamb of God, Jesus my Lord, I pray. Amen. Well, next week we'll take a close look at Jesus as the Lamb of God in Isaiah 53. We'll close this lesson in a minute, but before we do, discuss the final discussion questions. And may God bless you richly as you seek to know the Lamb of God. Discussion question five. In what sense is God's provision for animal sacrifice, for the forgiveness of sins, an expression of his mercy? Were animal sacrifices actually adequate to atone for human sin? Discussion question six. What do you think God intended animal sacrifice to teach us about sin? What do sacrifices teach us about holiness? What do they teach us about God's nature? Pause the DVD now, discuss this question, and the lesson will be completed. Thanks and God bless you.